So listen, uh, I've used uh, a couple of resources. I've used, I've used a jigging resources as I've studied Hebrews, as I do in a lot of my studies. But I want to share with you uh, just in about two seconds here because we've got a lot, lot to do today. I want to share with you four resources that might be of value to you. Really three are of value and one is anecdotal to you. There's a guy who wrote a book, actually a commentary, on Hebrews. His name's William L. Lane. And it's the World Biblical Commentary. It's two volumes on the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is 13 chapters. He wrote two books of about 700 pages each. And the reason that he is so comprehensive in his work, uh, Lane's dead. All these guys right here are dead. Uh, they all lived, uh, well, some of them lived in the 18th century. But uh, Lane is probably one of the, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the respected Greek experts that I've ever had the privilege of reading and studying. He's just good. And so there's so much uh, around the original Greek as it relates to what the message is that the Hebrew writer is trying to convey to us. The other resource is a guy named A.B. Bruce. Uh, Mr. Bruce uh, was a Lutheran, and Mr. Bruce passed away in uh, 1899, 1899. And he was born like at the very first of the 18th century, 1800s. Uh, he was a Scottish guy, uh, educated overseas. Can't buy his book. Well, it's not true. You can buy his book. Uh, his commentary. He didn't, write, he didn't write a set of commentaries. He wrote just two or three commentaries or two or three uh, documents. One of them was on uh, an epistle to the Hebrews, about 500 pages. Uh, and the reason that I got a hold of A.B. Bruce's work was because of Dr. Neil Lightfoot, who wrote a, a small commentary that's used at Evelyn Christian. Uh, Lightfoot was a professor there. Matter of fact, Sam Bradley, I think, knew him and may have even sat under him. Uh, but, of course, Brother Lightfoot's passed away also. But he's the one who put me on to A.B. Bruce because as I read some of his work and he quoted some of the things that Bruce said, uh, and, and he made a statement that said, and, and A.B. Bruce revealed to me the soul of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And so I went and searched for his book. You can't get a hold of his book. There's only one volume available in all the United States that's for sale. It's in, in antiquity, right? And, uh, and I was going to buy it, uh, but it's $978. And so I didn't buy it. So I went in search on where I could find it, and, I, and there is, it's not in any place, in any li there is, it is in libraries, but it's not in digital form. I finally found it uh, in the University of Toronto and got permission from them. Uh, of course, I could read it online. It, they got in their volumes from an old uh, Presbyterian minister who would written all over it, so it's got all his notes in it, which is of value to you. Uh, but I sent a note to them, and they said, if you want to print it, as long as you don't commercialize it, you can print it. And so... I should have just bought the book because what I paid in print cartridges to print that book, <coughs> just about the same as what I'd have done if I'd have bought the book. But uh, Brother Lightfoot is correct. Uh, A.B. Bruce's work on Hebrews is astounding. It's just, it's breathtaking. The final resource <coughs> uh, is a guy named Gerald Payton, brother to Klein Payton and Harold Payton, right out of East Texas up here. And Gerald is the fellow who taught me the book of Hebrews and Sunset School of Preaching. So I had all of his old class notes, all of my old class notes, and all of his handouts. And uh, Gerald, uh, the Payton brothers are my favorite guys in the whole world, people I respect probably more than anybody in the world. And Gerald uh, only taught a few courses out there at Sunset, and he, and he didn't preach a lot. But the work that Gerald does, man, it's like a Ted Kell and a Jim McWiggins and... I mean, these guys are just good, and old Gerald's good. So a lot of the stuff that we've looked at in the book of Hebrews come out of him. I want to do something today. I'm not going to guarantee success. I don't even care if it is success. It's the Holy Spirit's work, and this is God's congregation. And I'm just here to help for a minute. And I, this is my last day for this quarter. I know you're thankful for that, and I'm kind of grateful too. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the entire quarter due to health reasons. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, you know that verse. And that's just the verse that's going to serve as a foundation for our study. We're going to study out of Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 today. 
And uh, I don't have time to cover every verse, but we're going to tell a story about those books here today that I think will be helpful to you. And so, uh, it says, faith is. And is is a verb of being. A verb of being. If I said Angie was in a coma, her state was is that she was comatose, right? That would be the state that she was living in at that point in time in her life. This is a being verb. It has everything to do with the state that you live in. So faith is a state that the believer lives in or can live in, right? It's different in action verbs. If I were to say, Angie ran fast, that's an action verb. She ran, right? Not a state of being. She ran and when she stopped running, she, you know, it's all over. That action's over. But in the faith concept of a state of being, you're in faith, you live in faith, you die in faith. Does that sound similar to Romans chapter 1 where Paul says that righteousness is from faith unto? Faith unto faith. It's a state of being. It's what we are. It's what we do. It's where we live. It is everything about us. Faith unto faith. Now, it's interesting that in the book of Romans, if I may, well, before I get there, let me just touch on a couple of things in Hebrews chapter 6. You need to open your Bible here, or you need to get your cell phone out. And don't get your cell phone out to text people. Get your cell phone out to get your Bible app open. It won't be clear what you're supposed to be doing when you get your cell phone out because some of you start playing games. Well, not all of you, but, well, maybe none of you. That could just be a frivolous accusation I shouldn't have made. But here's the fact. In the latter part of Hebrews chapter 10, there, are, there is an exhortation or an encouragement to the brethren, starting in verse 22, and it, and, and it says three things. The believer is called to three actions. Number one, he's called to draw near to God. Verse 22. In verse 23, he's told to hold unswervingly to the hope that resides in him. Don't let go of that hope that's inside of you. And then in verse 24, they, we are to spur one another on to good works. I want you to hear that again. We are to spur each other on to good works. And so if you think... Your brother or your sister doesn't have any responsibility to you in order to stay out of your business and stay out of your life and stay out of your affairs. You might want to go study that verse. For we have obligation to spur each other on to good works. Now what is the point of those three verses and why would they be important? If you were to read verse 25, it said, and remember the whole story of Hebrews is about the Hebrew brethren, that first century group of people who are now thinking about leaving Jesus, leaving the church, and going back to Judaism. They're going to go into apostasy, right? And anybody who has been a believer in Jesus, who's, ter who's, who's touched the first fruits of that gospel of redemption and salvation, who subsequently walks away from Jesus, goes into apostasy. They apostatize, right? They're gone. And he says it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get saved again early on in the book of Hebrews. And the reason is it's not that people who walk away can't be redeemed again. It's the fact that these Hebrew brethren, some of them have walked with Jesus. They, they, they actually walked on this earth with Jesus. And then for those who didn't walk with Jesus, they were able to see the signs and wonders and miracles of the apostles. They heard the preaching of the apostles. And the Hebrew writer's point is, is if, 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 if walking with Jesus didn't get it done, and if seeing and hearing the, the apostles and their work and their preaching doesn't get it done, what in the world else is the world going to bring you that might redeem you? It's going to almost be impossible for you to get redeemed if you ignore those things and don't accept those things. What else could we offer? And so now in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, because these folks are pretty close to going into apostasy and losing their faith, it says, and here's the sign, S-I-G-N, the sign of them losing their faith. All of a sudden, they've quit coming to the assembly of the church. They have begun to willingly separate themselves from the body. They're out doing other things. I'm sure some of them are chasing their business interests. I'm sure some of them are thinking about going back to Judaism. I'm sure there's a whole host of things that are going on. But the symptom of their apostasy is they no longer come to church. They won't come to the assembly anymore. They won't meet with brethren. They won't go do their own thing. And he says in the next verse, if they keep on deliberately sinning, 
What is the sin he's talking about? Now listen, there are a lot of Bibles in sin. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Is all sin deliberate? You bet it is. Man makes a choice, right? There's a desire setting out there, unholy desire, and you and I get to decide whether or not we yield our will to that desire. And when we yield our will to that desire, then that's what makes sin sin. Right? So all sin is deliberate. And you can look in the Bible and say, well, I'm not sure he's talking about deliberate sin or which deliberate sin is he talking about in the book of Hebrews. The deliberate sin he's talking about here in the book of Hebrews is that you have deliberately decided to let your faith dwindle until you no longer want anything to do with the brethren. That's, that's the deliberate sin. And he says, if you do that, where else are you going to go for sacrifice for sin? Where else are you going to go? And what he's saying to the brethren is, there's no place for you to go. You walk away from Jesus, where are you going to go get sacrifice for sin? Where are you going to go get help? That's, that's, that's his premise here. And so he launches into a discussion. You can see why now, let me back it. You see why now Hebrews 11 is written where it's written and why it's placed where it's placed. Right? He's worked all of this letter to tell them about the priesthood and the covenant and the oaths and the promises and the sacrifice and everything else. And he says, now, let me tell you, if you're not going to believe that and you're going to walk away from that, there are consequences. But wait, 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 before you go, before you leave, I want to tell you about faith. I want to tell you about faith. And so let's see what we might be able to learn about faith. Now, if you read the book of Romans, Paul mentions faith. He has some discourses, discourses in the book of Romans about faith. But most of Romans focuses on justification and grace and baptism, right? I'm not saying that faith's not mentioned there. That is not what I said. But I'm just saying when you look at the broader focus, right? You get the book of Hebrews, you barely find mention of baptism, interesting enough, in the book of Hebrews, but you get a lot of faith in the book of Hebrews. And so it's just the perspective and the needs of the audience is what's being addressed, right? Now, with that being said, if faith is that important, I might want to figure out what it might mean. Uh, i got to go here. i got about 50 slides. Angie said that means about a minute to slide. She ain't no good at math because I only have 45 minutes. 50 by 45, I can do that math. It ain't no good. Uh, it's really unfortunate, I believe, that there is a break by the guys who put the Bible together for us between Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 11. They put a chapter break in there. I wish they hadn't have. I wish they hadn't have done that to get to this verse. <clears throat> and I, and let, me just, let me just show you why in just a minute. Now listen, there isn't anybody, and I, and I, understand, I understand why the Church of Christ talks a little bit about faith, I want you to know that. I understand that. But I understand why the church of Christ talks a whole lot more about baptism, I think I do, than about faith. There's not hardly a denomination out there that exists that, that doesn't say they, that they're a faith organization, right? Right? Now, they may not mean by faith what you and I mean by faith. They may understand faith the way the Bible defines faith. But there's not a single denomination out there that who wouldn't totally tell you, well, you know, yeah, faith, oh yeah, we believe in faith. That's not been our battlegrounds for the last how many ever decades that we've been fighting this battle. Our battle has been over what? Baptism. Water baptism. And, and, and we mentioned faith in that discussion, in that battle, but the battle has been over water baptism. Well, you know what? I got some news for you here. That's an important discussion, and we need to have that discussion, and we need to firm our beliefs on that discussion. But listen, our religiosity, this new religious system that you and I operate under, is all about what? All about faith. It is all about faith. It is about nothing else other than faith. Period. And that's what a Hebrew writer is going to seek to demonstrate to us today as we look at some things here in chapter 11 if I can ever get there. Ken used to say 
The Bible says the righteous will live by faith. Ken used to say, by faith the righteous will live. By faith. By faith. The righteous will live. You want to know what that means? I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Because it's taken me a long time to get it. So let's talk about faith for just a minute here before I have to run through Hebrews chapter 11. We've been looking for a minister for a long time, preacher for a long time. Does anybody here believe we're going to ever hire a preacher? I believe we're going to finally hire a preacher, don't you? I have faith in that. I, I have total faith in that. I have total confidence in that. Now, are we going to hire the guy who's perfect? Ain't never met that guy. I can remember when, uh, I can remember when Ken tried out for preaching here a hundred years ago. And old Mark Freeman asked me, uh, Angie and I were out of town that week. Didn't hear him preach. The week after, Ken, uh, the week after, Mark Freeman asked me what I thought about old Ken. And I said, well, I, I, we wasn't here, I don't know. And he said, well, he doesn't, you know what, old Ken doesn't, this is what he told me. He said, old Ken doesn't fit, not a single demographic. He's old. Is Kendra here? I can probably get by. He's old. Maybe I should say he's older. Right? He's from a little old hick town up in, you know, somewhere, Arkansas, wherever. And he really doesn't fit our profile. He doesn't fit the demographics that we're looking for in a minister, but we think there might be something there. Well, you know, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Here is, we've set a criteria. And it is, listen, it is interesting to me. I'm going to say this, and I'm not pointing the finger at nobody. The elders don't get upset and leave. Well, no, you could ask me to leave. I couldn't ask you to leave. Don't get up and ask me to leave. Uh, but listen, um, it's amazing to me that we can get an elder and install an elder in about six or eight weeks. And we can put deacons up in about six or eight weeks. There's a reason why we're successful in doing that. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not being critical of that. And we've been a year plus looking for a minister, right? It's because these elders want to get us the right man. That's the right thing to do. And Butch, don't you give up. Scott, don't you give in. Raymond, where you at, brother? Don't you dare walk away, right? And, and I don't see Nathan. I see Lindy. Lindy, you tell Nathan not to give up. So what, all is, what is that about? What is, what, is, what is that about? Well, you know, here's what faith says. All things work together for good. Is that a promise? That is a promise. Is there a condition to that promise? To those that what? To those that love the Lord. To those that love the Lord. And so, I want you to listen to me very carefully here. You misunderstand me. So, these elders are going to finally hire somebody. I don't know who. Don't have a clue. And when they do, he's not going to be the perfect guy. And Ken wasn't either, to your dismay. But here's the promise. If whoever they hire loves the Lord, loves His church, and loves His Word, and if He comes to a church, that'd be me and you, and if we love the Lord, and we love His Word, and we love His church, do you think He can work all things to the good of this congregation? Well, I believe that. Do you believe that? It's what we call faith. It's a promise about something that's going to happen at some point in time in the future. He's going to work all those things. Now, He does that every day in our lives. Don't misunderstand me. That's not the only thing that promise applies to. But since we're in a preacher church, I thought it would be a good example. He's going to work that preacher problem out for us to our good because we're only going to... Scott, we're only going to hire a man that loves the Lord, that loves God, that loves His Word, and loves His church. And you're not going to hire nobody else. And you men who are elders are going to love God because you do, and you're going to love His church because you do, and you're going to love His Word because you do. And you know what? Everything's probably going to work out. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. I think everything's going to work out just fine. You lost your job, right? And you lost your job, and maybe you think it's unfair, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I don't have any idea. Right? But God made some promises to you about whether or not you would starve to death and whether or not you would have some clothing. Did He not? He did. Now, your problem is, is how to maintain your standard of life. 
I'm not going down after all these years as I've worked as hard as i worked to get up to here. Well, now wait a minute. They ain't got nothing to do with promise. You know what? And some individuals go out there and they get jobs and they start working weekends. They mess the assembly and all of a sudden they don't serve the church anymore and they don't do this and they don't do that. And they're so self-absorbed about making a living. They just kind of, it's not that they give up on Christ, but you know, they're just, their level of faith just dwindled. That's exactly what happened in the book of Hebrews. These brethren's faith is just dwindling away, dwindling away until finally they just go into apostasy. And if you were to ask some good old brother about that who's looking for a job because he's been out of a job and you were to ask him a question, you know what he would say to you? He would would give just that really intelligent answer that we always do. He would say something like, but don't you think the Lord expects me to take care of my family and support my family? Well, yeah, I believe that. But do I think and believe that, that He would say that you ought to pit that against faith and faithful living and faithful walk? God doesn't do that. And so don't you do that. Don't you do that. And so we're children of faith. We believe what he, what he has promised that we will receive. Now, go to, wow, turn that clock off. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 1. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Thank you whoever said, whoever questioned me right then. Thank you for knowing that sometimes I'm a little bit someplace else. It says that faith has a couple of qualities. That's the only slide you're going to see today. It says that faith is. It's foundational in nature. And interesting enough, I don't think you can see this across the bottom. Maybe I think you can. There's one Greek word up here. This hypostasis, that's the only place it appears in the entire New Testament. It doesn't appear in not a single other place. And the emphasis of that word in the Greek is that in faith, things hoped for become realized. It doesn't mean they become realized in the future. It does mean that, but that's not all that it embodies. Because of faith, we can see in our mind's eye as if they are real now. And that's the way we define hope. It's the expectation, right? Right? We, we see it in our mind's eye as if it is a reality now. And it's very parallel to the statement in Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 1 where it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory in the, in the what? The exact, he's not a shadow. He's not a figment. He's real. He is the exact representative. You know Jesus, you know God. You know God, you know Jesus. It's real. And so faith is, is really, faith is Right? It's a state that we live in, and it brings those things out there that we can't see, the unseen. It, you know, it brings them nearer. It brings them closer because we expect them. We believe them. And the other component of this thing is, is that faith has a conviction about it. You know what a conviction is, right? You go into a courtroom, and they question you as a witness, right? And you offer evidence, statements, evidence, an individual is going to be either acquitted or convicted based on that evidence. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, they're going to call up a whole bunch of evidence to convict individuals that God's promises are true, that your faith is not misplaced. So now, with all that in mind, you got all that? You got some of it? You got a little bit of it? Okay. Got somebody back there shaking their hands. Good enough for me. We'll leave everybody else behind. So while faith pertains to the invisible, it does. Things unseen, right? Things unseen mean you can't see them. Right? And it pertains to things unknown. That's what faith pertains to. Faith pertains to those things that are invisible and unknown. You and I can't see them, we can't know them. We may have something about them, but we don't know them. And we can't see them. So how does this work? How does this whole faith thing work? Because we got this word evidence up here. In the Greek, that's fine. In the Hebrew letter, it says assurances or conviction or whatever, right? So we got this evidence about this thing that we can't see, and we got this evidence about maybe something that we can't know. It's kind of strange, isn't it? So let's see what that means now. In the back of your mind, I need you to write on your head 
James chapter 2, where it says, Faith without what? Is what? And what in the world are works? Don't answer that question. Faith without works is dead. We have puked all over ourselves for decades trying to think about that. Let's just let the Hebrew writer maybe demonstrate for us what a Bible faith might look like. Let's just let the Holy Spirit tell us about that rather than us up making up stuff for a minute. So now, you're in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. and We're going to read. It says... In verses 2 and 3, y'all remind me to come back and say one more thing about Hebrews chapter 10 in a minute. If I don't do that, somebody stand up and say, but what about chapter 10? Now remind me. Hebrews 11, 2 and 3, it says, this is what the ancients were commended for. This is what they were commended for. By faith, we, by faith, the state that we live in, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that, it, that what is seen now, what we presently see in this creation was not made out of what it was not made out of what was visible. Now, so you and I can see the mountains, the seas, the sun, the moon, the stars, and every one of those things are visible. We can see this creation, right? You drove you drove to church this morning, and you drove on creation. Now I understand you drove on concrete or asphalt or something, but underneath that was something called dirt. And God created that dirt. You drove on His creation today to get here. And we see that and feel that and understand that, right? But by faith, where did all that come from? From where? God created it. Now, can you see God? Talk to me, brethren. Help me a little bit. Can you see God? Anybody from ever seen God? What would be evidence that God exists? The dirt you drove on this morning would be a good example, wouldn't it? Be a good example, right? Did God do a work in order to build your faith? He did, didn't He? He did indeed. And so faith is about things that we can't see, but we see evidence of those things that we can't see. It produces some evidence and you go, oh, okay. So now let's go to something a little bit more concrete. Uh, because that logic of the unseen, but evidence of the unseen, is all through Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, it says, By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Now listen to the th train of thought here. So we're going to put Abel on the witness stand and, we're going to, and the witness in the courtroom has to answer questions. He doesn't have a choice. He's got to answer questions. And so uh, the prosecutor says, Abel, do you believe that God exists? And old Abel says, well, yes, of course I believe that God exists. And he says, well, have you seen him? And Abel's going to say, well, no, of course not. I haven't seen him. Well, then the prosecutor is going to say, well, do you believe that he's worthy of worship? And old Abel's going to say, well, yeah, I absolutely believe this God that I cannot see, but that I believe in, is worthy of worship. Well, do you believe that, his, that your worship ought to comply with his commands or his orders? And he'll say, absolutely. I absolutely believe that whatever God says that we ought to do is exactly what I should do. And that's important because that's exactly what made Cain's sacrifice what? unacceptable. He didn't follow the commands of God. And so when the old prosecutor said, well, Abel, do you believe that you ought to do exactly what God says around worship? Abel said, absolutely. He says, can you prove any of these things? Can you prove that you believe in this God that you can't see? And Abel says, well, yeah, I can. You see that altar over there? With that specified wood? And with that specified offering up on that wood, and you see that fire that's been lit, that's evidence of my faith. That's evidence of my faith. That's how I know that there is a God even though I can't see Him. 
is that because my faith causes me to believe in the promises that He has given me, that I am going to behave in a certain way. You see that? Now, what is that behavior? It's walk. What else is that behavior? Faith without what? Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. See, for old Abel to jump up there and say, Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. Doesn't get it done. But because he believes, it produces a behavior or a lifestyle or a walk or a work. And it makes my faith alive. And that is, that is the theme of all the book of the Hebrews. Keep going with me here because the clock's going to run out on us. So the unseen element of Abel's faith is this unseen God. The evidence of Abel's faith is the fact that he went out there and built an altar and sacrificed on it because he said, you know what? My God is worthy. And I believe in my God's promises. Then in, in 5 and 6, it says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God was taken, has taken him away. Before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God and without faith and without faith and without faith. You know what? It's absolutely impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. And so here's old Enoch in the Old Testament and he believes in God he can't see and he believes in a reward that he can't see. He's only been told about it. But he can't see it. He can't know it. But he believes it. Because without faith it's impossible to believe God. And so, it says in, in Genesis, in two verses, 22, uh, uh, I think it's chapter here, um, chapter, not chapter, six, chapter 5, chapter 5 of Genesis, in two different verses, 22 and 24, it says that Enoch walked with God. Well, how did he walk with God? How did he know how God walked? How did he know that? Well, he learned that God was a God of justice and truth and righteousness and forgiveness and grace and mercy and everything else, right? And he looked at that and he liked the way God walked. He liked, he liked what he saw. He, he liked how that developed character in, in a different set of standards than what he was used to. And it says then he walked like God walked. He walked with God. He embraced those things that God embraced. And the more they walked, the closer they got to finally God just walked them out on into heaven. Well, what's, what's the evidence? He can't see God. He can't know about that promise. What's evidence of Enoch's faith? His walk. His walk. His work. Every day he gets up and serves God. And Enoch's faith is not dead. Well, faith without works is what? Let's keep reading. <sighs> Seems like I'm doing all the work up here. Chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, the unseen, things we can't know, Can't know it. Hadn't seen it. In holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, keeping with faith. Now, how does a man build an ark? One just suddenly appear? Well, God told him how to build it. How does a man build it? You build a well house this week? Did you get a saw? Did you get a hammer? Did you get some wood? Did you go to work? I'm sure it's a fine looking well house. Noah built an ark by going to get saw and some wood and a hammer and he went to work. How many years did he build? I don't, it takes you as long as he built an ark, but how long do you think he worked on building that ark? It took him 120 years to build something because he had faith in God about something that he knew nothing about. Had he ever seen rain? Had he ever heard a clap of thunder? Never! You think he asked, oh God, rain, what's rain? You think he asked him, well God, when's that going to happen? 
Uh Uh-uh. He went to work. He believed in holy fear. He ought to build an ark. What's evidence of Noah's faith? That saw, that hammer, that wood. Faith without what? Works is what? Noah went to work. Changed his life. I have no idea what Noah's profession was before God told him to build an ark. I have no idea what his skill set was. Period. And I furthermore have no clue from Scripture as to what priorities Noah had as it relates to his life. I don't have one iota of a clue. But faith reprioritized his life and changed his profession. He had one thing in mind. Working for God. And he had that one thing in mind because of faith. And faith without works is dead. So anytime we teach James chapter 2 in the future, we're going to try to remain him. We're going to try to do our best to remember Hebrews chapter 11. Next, Hebrews chapter 11, 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when he, this has about three different things in it. I want you to listen to the 350. In, in, in this next section, I want you to listen for the things that he does not know that he cannot see. I want you to listen for him, look for him, help me here, look for him. And then I want you to look of the evidence that is provided as a result of his faith. Once you look at his works as a result of his faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he could later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Is that the unseen? He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know it. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. And he lived as tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. There's the second thing. He went to the land and he lived as a stranger because he was looking for a city that God had built and he didn't know where it was at. But he knew that the promised land was not the arrival of that architectic building built by God. Right? And so he didn't go to the promised land to build a house. Didn't build him a palace. He lived as a stranger. Because God had made a promise. Abraham, I'm going to carry you to a home that I am the architect of. And he behaved accordingly. That's what faith does, right? Let's keep going. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was able to bear, enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made a promise. What was the promise? The promise that was unseen, but she considered him faithful. And so what, her and, what did her and, and Abraham do? I'm going to cut to the chase here because we're running out of town. What did they do? The Scripture says that her, she was dead twice. Her womb was dead. She couldn't conceive. She's sterile. And Abraham is sterile. He's way past childbearing. What they do based on their faith and the promise of a child? They went and procreated. Even knowing what they knew. Knowing, knowing physically their condition. What they do by faith? They went and procreated. They said, well, you know what? I can't see that promise, but I believe it. I believe that what he's telling us is true. We're going to have a child. Even though it makes no sense whatsoever. See, faith without works is dead. Even in the starkest situations, when you look at something and say, that is is physically impossible. Faith walks. Faith works. That's what it does. And so, there you have it. We have these unseen, invisible things and Abraham and Sarah behave in really strange manners about their walk and their work because they have faith 
And what they did around to everybody who looked at them was evidence of faith. You know, I don't have time for this, but I'm going to do this. What? (laughs) Thank you. Is it reasonable for somebody to come to you and say, do you have faith? Is that that reasonable? You think it is? Or do you think, or do you think, let me just give you another alternative for whoever answered that. I didn't hear your answer. Or do you think that people should know you have faith by your... Kind of stupid for somebody to ask if old Dave Short has faith, right? Warren, you should be able to tell whether I have faith or not. Brother, you should be able to tell whether old Dave Short's a child of faith or not. You sure should. Because my life will give evidence. Even though I haven't received the promise, the total promise yet. Even though I haven't been taken up to glory yet. Some of our brothers and sisters have. I have not been. But I believe in that promise, brother. And because I believe in that promise, I'm going to work and walk in a very specific way because of my faith. And I'm going to evidence that I believe what I believe. Because faith is the state that I live in. I believe that every day. I go to bed every night not worrying about things because I believe, I believe that the promises that God has promised He will deliver if I walk and work. And He is worthy of my walk and my work. Faith without works is dead. And if I don't walk, if I don't walk by faith, then I am dead. I am dead. You know what he says? He says, what about Samson? What about Samuel? What about Gideon? What about Barak? What about David? What about Jetheth? You know what he says? He says there are so many other Old Testament characters that I can name who walked a walk and performed great things because they believed in the promise And they provided evidence of their faith in the way they walked. And you know what he says? He said that the world is not worthy of you or of me. Not worthy. Not worthy, not one of us is the world worthy of. Because we believe in the promises of God. And we walk. And we walk in that confidence. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Need one more class. Don't have time. Hebrews chapter 10. You say, well, Dave, that's all Old Testament stuff. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. Go there, please. These brethren in Hebrews who are about to go into apostasy, who are about to walk away. Don't you ring that last bell for a minute. (laughs) Who are about to walk away from Jesus, who have let their faith crumble. And I'll tell you something, you find somebody, you show me the fellow who doesn't go to church anymore, and you show me the fellow who's quit serving, and you show me the fellow who's self-absorbed, and you can say whatever you want to about that fellow. But if he's tasted the blood of Jesus, if he's tasted redemption, and he no longer is a servant, no longer faithful. It's because he's let his faith dwindle. It's not because I discouraged him, even though I may have discouraged him. It's because he let his faith go of God the Father in every promise that was given to him. And he got absorbed with other stuff. He's going to honor his own promises. Not worry about the promises of God. And so in Hebrews, we have a bunch of folks here who are about to walk away. They've let their faith dwindle. Look though at those brethren in verse 32. The Hebrew writer says, Do you remember those days after you had received the light, after you had received the promise, after you'd come to the knowledge of what was out there in front of you? When you endured in great conflict, Full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Other times you stood by 
uh, side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew, you knew, you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your faith. You see that? You see that evidence of their faith in times past? When they were up on the faith scale, what were they willing to do? Anything and everything. They suffered with other brethren. They took insults. And everything bad happened to them. And the Hebrew writer says, don't you remember when your faith was at the top and you believed in the promises? And you walked that walk. Whatever you do, don't throw that away. Whatever you do, don't throw it away. Because the righteous live by faith. I'm done. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 says that our faith and our hope, are you ready? That our faith and our hope are the anchor of our soul. Not your job, not your wealth, not the kind of car you drive, not your family. Faith and hope is your anchor and my anchor. God bless you. Thank you for letting me teach. Maybe somebody will do it again.